Our Father God, again, we thank you for this time you have given us, for the opportunity, Father, and the freedom to gather here in your house, to come together, Father, without fear of reprisal, without fear that, Father, someone would meet us here and take us away. We thank you, Father, for the responsibilities ours as your children to bring honor and glory to you on the day that you have set aside, that we might bring a collective voice in song and in worship. Be with us today, Father, as we open your word and further worship, that as we worship you in spirit and in truth, that your word, Father, would be true to all hearts and that our hearts would receive it as truth and that our hearts would believe it as truth and our hearts would live it as truth. And that, Father God, each and every one of us would live our lives not only to be a reflection of your love, but also, Father God, that we would bring our love to you in each and every life. Father, we ask that you be with our brothers and sisters all over the world that are suffering, that are under persecution, perhaps in, in jail or prison somewhere, or perhaps in hiding. Father God, we ask that your presence be near them, guard them, keep them, undergird them with your strength. Help us to remember them, Father, in our freedom, that we might be a, a obedient and faithful prayer warrior for each and every one of them. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Let's turn into our Bibles to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 8. Blind eyes can see. I shared with you many years ago, I read a book that was entitled God Smuggler. And that book was written by a gentleman known as Brother Andrew. I was in high school when that first came out. It was quite some time ago. And I remember reading it on a trip that I went on to go skiing one, one Saturday. And I just about finished it in that short trip that I took. And it was an interesting book. And what really stood out to me is with this man who literally would take Bibles across the Iron Curtain, smuggle them into Iron Curtain countries, Right there in his suitcase, he wouldn't try to hide them, no false bottom, nothing. He would put the Bibles right there in his, in his luggage, and he would pray before the people would inspect his luggage, Lord, let eyes that can see be blind, and let blind eyes see. Never was stopped, never was interrupted, never was incarcerated for smuggling Bibles. Kept them right out there in the open. It was as a young person, as a high school senior, it absolutely fascinated me. There are eyes that are blind that can see with their hearts. And there are eyes that can see that are blinded in their hearts. Tonight in our text, we're going to see two places. In verse 22 and verse 27. We see in verse 22 a city of pessimism. It's a city of Bethsaida. Jesus performed many miracles there in many of the cities around Bethsaida. He did, they didn't believe him, though. They refused. Their pessimism was, was absolutely unbelievable. Matthew chapter 11 reveals that Jesus rebuked, rebuked them for their unbelief. Matthew eleven twenty four 24 says, But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. And we know all the, the ins and outs of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. We understand that why God destroyed those cities in that time. And yet Jesus said, even in light of all of that, it is more tolerable for Sodom in the day of judgment, meaning that the day of judgment had not yet come for Sodom, the citizens of Sodom. Even though the city was destroyed with fire and brimstone, even though they had been in hell for all these thousands of years, yet there is yet to come a judgment for them. Understand that. We talked about that this morning, the judgment seat of Christ for the Christians, yes, but the great white throne judgment for the lost people. 
Bethsaida means the house of fish. It was a fishing village. I don't know if the people were just so involved with their commerce, so involved with everyday life, so involved with the things that seem important to each and every one of us. But in light of Scripture and in light of Jesus himself, the Savior, it pales in comparison. What job is more important than Jesus? What hobby can you actually do that is more important than pleasing God? What activity can you be involved in that would be more important than worshiping God? We see here that Bethsaida was a city that was cursed by Jesus. You can go to the city of Bethsaida today. In fact, we, we drove right by it in our first trip to Israel. Capernaum was, was closed. We got there too late. We'd had a problem with this, this trip from the very beginning. And we got to Capernaum, and they had closed the gates and locked it up. And the bus driver, who was an Israeli paratrooper, took us up to, to the Golan Heights. And we went past this ruined city called Bethsaida. And I remember my father-in-law pointing out and saying, there's the city that Jesus cursed. Still isn't built today. They tried to rebuild, but guess what? It didn't work. We see a city that was cursed by, by Christ. In verse 27, there is a city of paganism. Caesarea Philippi, named after the Caesar. It was a city of multiple pagan shrines. It was a center of worship for paganism. It was a place, if you were a Gentile or you were a convert, if you were, if you were Jewish, and a convert to their heathen practices, you could go up there to Caesarea Philippi, which was there at the foot of Mount Hermon, up north. And you could worship whatever god you wanted to worship there. We see in verse 27 a, a city of paganism. Tonight we're going to take a look at what happens in these two cities. As Dickens would say, it would be a tale of two cities. A city that was occupied by people who could see and yet were blind, and a city that was occupied by blind people, yet the greatest announcement of the Messiahship of Jesus was made there in a pagan city. We're going to look at the city of paganism and the city of pessimism. Let's start with verse 22. Mark chapter 8, verse 22. And then he came to Bethsaida, and they brought, bought a, brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I, I see men like trees walking. And then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up, and he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Then he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. Now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi, and on the road he asked his disciples, saying to them, who do men say that I am? And so they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah and others, one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. And then he sternly warned them that they should tell no one about him. What an interesting portion of Scripture. Two cities. A city of pessimism and a city of paganism. We see the blind man at Bethsaida in verses 22 through 26 is a place where eyes could see. And yet they were blinded to the very presence of God in their midst. I believe that there are many people in our town that are blinded to the presence of God in their midst. There are many things in this town that, that occupy their mind or occupy their time or occupy their interest. And lo and behold, they have no eyesight for the things of God. 
That's why it's difficult when you go to talk to them and you try to start out a conversation with them by saying, hey, I'd like to talk to you about God. They're saying, well, I don't have any time for you. Why? Because they're blinded to the things of God. That's why we should not take it personal. My grandmother was blind. Blind people are very unique. Blind people are very unique. My grandmother couldn't see anything. And, and so when I was always instructed as a child when we went to go see my grandmother. I always got the same lecture. Grandma's going to touch you on your face. Don't be scared. Okay? Grandma's going to want to feel your face. Don't be frightened. And I was as a child. As a little child, that scared me. Come here to Grandma. Ah, you know. It was scary. You know, I'm not trying to be ugly to my grandmother. You know, she's in heaven. She sees now. And if she's hearing this, I'm sorry, Grandma, but it's the truth. I was afraid of my grandmother because as a child, I did not understand. The second thing they said to me, don't go change the furniture. You don't do that to Grandma's house. And you know, as I grew older, I understood why. Grandma had everything memorized. She could walk anywhere. It looked like she could see she walked so carefully around the house. I also was told the third thing was be careful what you eat at Grandma's house because she still liked to cook. And you know, when you got breakfast with her, sometimes you got eggshells in your eggs. Blind people were very unique, but they were blind. And they needed help. This man was no different. We see the blind man. The first touch of Jesus was a very interesting touch. In verse 22 and 23, we see, first of all, the request of the men. Now, what do you mean the request? What about the request? Of the men? It wasn't the man who came to Jesus. It was the men who brought him. Do you see that in verse 22? 22 basically tells us, Then he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him. Now the question is why? We're not told. Was this a group of people who were trying to test Jesus? Was this a group of people who had heard all the great things that Jesus had done? And here was their old friend Throckmorton. He's blind. Let's take him. Maybe Jesus will heal him. But we see the request of the men. He was brought by the others. Why? This man represents something very unique in our world. There are individuals, men and women, young people, who I honestly believe if we don't bring them to Christ, they won't come. You see, that's the whole aspect of evangelism, going out into the highways and byways, compelling people to come in. There are some people who are so wrapped up in this world, they are blind to the things of God, and they have no clue that they need to come to Christ. And that's why it's important that Jesus said you go out into the whole world, to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth, and you go and you compel them, please come to Christ. That's why we have missionaries. Because there are some people who will not come unless we bring them. There is no indication that that man said, hey, I want to go see Jesus. But there's every indication that there were men that brought him to Jesus. Luke 14, 23 says, Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house might or may be filled, those that need to be brought in. They'll never come in if we don't bring them in. It just won't happen. In verse 23, the first part of verse 23, we see the removal of the man. Jesus takes the man and they bring them to Jesus, and what's the first thing he does? Well, let's step outside of the city gates. Let's leave the city. Wait a minute, Jesus. You got a lot of people around you over here. They want to see it too. Well, Jesus, you're going to have a wonderful ministry if you just do it here and there. But you see, there's a reason why Jesus took him outside of the city. You see, the city was cursed. Jesus had already cursed the city. And the bottom line is this, that no miracles were promised to be performed in a city that would not recognize God. Simple as that. 
We see the removal of the man. Finally, in verse 23, we see the response of the master. And this is one of these unusual scripture texts that you say, Pastor, why did he spit on him? The only thing I can say to that is, number one, I'm going to meet Jesus one day, and that's one of those lists I've got, you know. I keep in my pocket, I go, okay, Jesus, all right, why did you spit on the man? We see it as something in our culture, as something disgusting. I've been spit upon before. It's not fun. It's it's not pleasant at all, to be honest with you, especially if you're not expecting it. But the bottom line is this. Jesus gave the blind man a sensory experience, something that he could feel, something that he knew was different, something that would arise the faith of the man in this matter. You see, with my grandmother, it was always, let me touch your face. It was another, and it wasn't enough for me to say, Grandma, I'm here, don't touch me. <laughs> Even though as a kid, I would have enjoyed that. But you see, my grandmother had to feel, my grandmother had to have her other senses. The only thing I can think of is Jesus employed the senses of this man that were heightened because of his blindness. So we see here the response of the master. Look at verse 24, a singular reply, a strange remedy. But look at a singular reply here in verse 24. In verse 24, the Bible says, And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Well, Jesus, how come he didn't see clearly right away? We see his reply of imperception. He had obviously seen before, hadn't he? How did he recognize trees? How did he recognize people? If you couldn't see before, how would you know? I see this and this there, especially if it's all fuzzy or blurry to you. So obviously he had seen before. Obviously they were trees and people in his eyes. They looked like people, but they looked like trees, you know. Something was happening here. There was a reply of incompleteness. There was some type of hindrance. What was it? We don't know. Could have been a demonic hindrance. Well, why would God have a hindrance to God? Why would Jesus have a hindrance? Remember Jesus telling the the disciples, some don't leave unless through prayer and fasting. This could have been a demonic interference. The man said, I'm beginning to see. I see things a little fuzzy. And so we see his reply of incompleteness. In verse 25 and 26, we see the final touch, perfect sight. You know, when people come to church for the very first time, they don't always see clearly, do they? That's why it's important to make a second. Well, I got him to come for one time. I got her to come. You know, why didn't they receive Christ? Why didn't they get saved? It's because they're not seeing clearly. They're seeing things, but not clearly the way they should see them. We see here the the final touch in verse 25, the restoration of the man. The Bible says, And then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up, and he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Folks, for some people, not only do they need to be brought to Christ, but they need a little time to come to Christ. I just read several articles in the, in the, uh, the magazine, uh, uh, Israel, My Glory. I love that magazine. I've taken it ever since I was a young man. Zvi was always the first article I always looked up. The first, it was in the back. I always turned to the back to read it first. He was a wonderful Jewish man who got saved during the Holocaust. His, all his family were killed in the Holocaust, and as a young child, he escaped got to Israel and basically got in all the wars and, and did all that, but he became, he's such a born-again Christian. He walks into the yeshivas, the schools of the ultra-Orthodox and sits down and debates with the Jewish rabbis. Wonderful man. Died just recently. Make a long story short, they had a wonderful thing about it. One thing that Zvi always said is, look, you have to be careful to try to Expect God to work on your schedule. He doesn't. People are ever people are different. That's like the time I I thought I found the perfect perfect 
answer to evangelism. I had led a lady to the Lord in the hospital, or a man to the Lord in the hospital. His name was Avery. And I said, no, excuse me, Aubrey. I said, Aubrey, would you like to receive Christ? She said, you're going to have a very, very, very serious surgery to, uh, tomorrow morning. Would you like to receive Christ? He says, you know, Pastor, he says, I just can't see to do it. Just can't see to do it. And so I talk a little bit more with him, and finally I come back. Before I left, I said, Avery, I mean, Aubrey, would you like to receive Christ? I just can't see to do it. He kept answering that. So I said, hey, you mind if I pray for you? He said, no, no, I'll do it. I said, Lord, take the scales from his eyes. Let him see his need for Jesus. And I'm not joking you. As I opened my eyes, he jerked like somebody took a cattle prod and went, poof, like that too. He just, his whole body jerked. And he opened his eyes and I said, Aubrey, would you like to receive Christ? He said, I'd love to. I said, man, I have discovered the perfect tool to use for evangelism. Nobody will be able to say no to me anymore. Boy, the next time I walked in, I was loaded for bear. You ever receive Christ? No, I don't, I'm not a Christian. Oh, let me pray for you. <laughs> Lord, you know, I asked him, do you want to receive Christ? No, no, I'm not interested. No, no, I'm not interested. Finally, I said, let me, can I pray for you? Sure, Lord, take the scales from his eyes. After you're done, I said, amen. I said, hey, how would you like to be saved? Would you like to be saved today? He says, I told you before, I don't want to be saved. <clears throat> Thought I had it down. Not everybody's the same, folks. Not everybody's going to get saved the first time they come to church. Don't give up. Keep inviting, bringing people to Christ. They're hearing the gospel. You say, well, I don't see anybody coming forward. That nobody's being moved. But listen, folks, the Holy Spirit moves among us, and he moves at his pace, his direction, his timing, not ours. Sometimes when we have our services, we give an altar call. No one comes forward. We're planting seeds, planting seeds, planting seeds. Somebody comes by later, waters, waters, waters. Soon somebody comes and the, the harvest is given. That's why Paul said, look, you know, Apollos plants, uh, I plant the seed, Apollos waters, and God gives the increase. It's not our timing, but it's God's. We are just to say, come and see. Come and see. It's that simple. Come and see. We have the blind man. We see the, the restoration of the man. We see his health is restored. In verse 26, the request of the Messiah, his command of restrictions. What happened here in verse 26? And then he said, he sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the, into the city or the town nor tell anyone in the town. There are no crowds needed and no crowds wanted. Remember many times Jesus, when they would go, they'd tell everybody what happened. He couldn't even walk two steps without a crowd. So, so crowded. We see his charge of restriction. Bethsaida was a city under a curse. I don't know if you've ever felt that eerie feeling that something's wrong in this place. You ever been somewhere and you just, it just, I, I'm not trying to say to look for feelings, but it just, you know, just doesn't feel right. We don't know what's happened. We don't know what kind of spirit is there. We see this city was under God's curse, and what a tragic situation for a city to be under the curse of God because of its unbelief and its skepticism. What if God would say that about our city? What if God, if we'd go out, let's say, to Roanoke and win somebody to Christ, and they'd say, don't go into Fort Wayne and tell anybody about it. I don't want Fort Wayne people to hear about the gospel. Well, how could God do that? You know, the Spirit of God is not always going to strive with men. Do you know there are times when God says no more to individuals? I literally witnessed to a guy till I was blue in the face. His name was Gary. Gary, would you receive Christ? Oh, I'd love to, preacher, but I'm just too young, and I don't want to do it right now. He had a motorcycle accident, almost lost his leg. God spared him of it. And man, I mean, he'd listen. In fact, 
the latter time I began coming, he kept saying, will you tell me more about this? Tell me again about Jesus. And I'd tell him, come on, Gary, you can receive Christ. No, no, no. Last day, he said, I'm leaving. I said, well, Gary, would you receive Christ? He said, no, preacher, come on by my house. Come on by my house. And so I said, sure thing. And so the next week I called. Gary, can I? No, not this week. It just really wouldn't be a good week. Gary, can I come by this week? No, no, it's not a good week. Finally, I just showed up one day, and he wasn't even there. Back later on, he just didn't answer his phone anymore. Bottom line is, there came a time when God said, Gary, I won't bother you anymore. The Seder was told by God, don't worry. I'm not going to bother you anymore. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. A city under the curse of God. Next we see in verse 27 through 30, the blind men at Caesarea. We see the blind man at Bethsaida, but how about the blind men at Caesarea, a place where blind eyes could see? Jesus had gone there to privately to pray. The book of, of Luke tells us in Luke 9, 18, and it happened as he was alone praying. They said it was on the way, Luke, I mean, Mark says here, as they were walking, as they were journeying along the path, Jesus apparently had stopped to pray. And as he had stopped to pray, he began to ask questions. You know, Jesus has a way of getting to our life by asking questions, does he not? There are many times that Jesus is not looking for the obvious answers, he's looking for our heart. I want to know what our heart believes. In John, the sixth chapter, in verse 66, I found it very unique that it was John 6, 66. <laughs> in John 6, 66, his disciples began to leave him. The Bible says, and from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. It says that he turned to his disciples and said, will you leave me also? Obviously, he was praying because he saw that suddenly his ministry had gone from the popular years now to going towards the cross. When he said to the population, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me, the Bible says, and his disciples began to leave him. You see, everybody's up for the free lunch. Everybody's up for the healing. Everybody's up for all the miraculous things. Jesus walking on water. Man, my goodness, who wouldn't want to see that? Isn't that exciting? Listen, the church had been filled over the years with people looking to fill their fantasy with some type of speculation. Now it gets to the point where, hey, if you're going to follow Jesus, you need to deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow him. And they don't want to do it anymore. And the disciples began to leave him. And so he went to this place to pray. And as he was praying, he came to the first question. The first question revealed partial sight. You see in verse 27, a deliberate question. Verse 27, now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road he asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say? That I am. We see it was a question about impression. His disciples were leaving him. Jesus wanted to know what their heart was all about. The people had begun to say, you know, you're asking too much for me, Jesus. I'm willing to, I'm willing to have the ba basket of fish. I'm willing to have the loaves. I'm willing to watch everybody get saved. But Jesus, don't ask me to give my life to you and follow you. That's why the disciples, when they answered Jesus, said, we've given up everything to follow you. And that's exactly what Jesus had said to his disciples. And that's exactly why the disciples left him. Because they said, we have too much to give up to follow you. And folks, as a Christian, as a born-again Christian, we have to understand we are servants of Christ. We are called to serve. We have been given gifts to serve. 
at your born-again experience. God placed gifts inside of you to use for His honor and glory. And you will, as I am, going to be held accountable for the use of those gifts. We're going to have to answer to Him. Why didn't you use the gifts? I've often said, and I've said many times, folks, we have used the gifts that God has given us to go into secular realms and earn more money and, and have a great time and, and experience great wealth by what God has given us rather than give to the kingdom. At least you could have done was take the money that you earn from the gifts that God has given you and put it into the kingdom rather than burying it in the backyard, as Jesus said. We see the deliberate question. It's a question about impression. What kind of impression do you have about me? And then there's a question about identification. Who am I? But look at the diverse answers in verse 28. I find that very unique. Their answer was a safe, popular version. <laughs> Who do you say I am? Oh, listen, if you tweet that out, or I don't know what all the words, are, that just sounded neat to say, tweet that out. Now that we have this new Facebook, I'm just on top of everything, you know. <laughs> I still can't get over somebody not liking me. Well, you know, what's, what's not, what is this? Somebody cannot like me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, why do I want to put something on the web that people say, I don't like you, you know? But we see here Jesus put this out, and the, and the popular version was brought into play. Someone said because of his preaching, oh, they think you're John the Baptist. Herod thought that. Oh my gosh, the guy had cut his head off. He's out preaching again. What in the world is going on? It's John the Baptist come back from the dead. Popular version. Who's Jesus today? Oh, he was a good man, good teacher. Wonderful philosopher. Good Jewish guy. What kind of a guy a Jewish mother could love. Because of his praying, they said, You are Elijah the prophet. You pray like Elijah. You pray and the fire falls from the sky. Lo and behold, someone said, because of his passion, you are like the prophets. Didn't say you were one of the prophets come back from dead, but he says you are like the prophets. The final question was asked in verse 25, excuse me, 29 and 30. The first question was asked, revealed partial sight. It was like them looking out of a glass dimly, as Paul would say. They saw Jesus as an equal to John the Baptist. They saw Jesus as Elijah the prophet, or they saw Jesus as a great prophet, a great teacher. But the second question, the final question, brought perfect sight. In verse 29, look at the first part, a direct question. Very direct. And he said, but who do you say that I am? We see, it was a personal decision, was it not? I love these people say, well, that matter about Jesus and that religious stuff, preacher, that's, 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 a, that's a personal matter, isn't it? No, excuse me, it's a private matter, isn't it? This is a private thing between me and God. I, no, I'm sorry, it's not a private matter. This was done very publicly. Jesus hung on a cross very publicly. Jesus rose from the dead, revealed himself to the, to the multitudes very publicly. And that's why he asks us when we receive him to make a public profession, not a private, but to make a public profession. That's a very public matter. But we see here it was a very personal decision. Who do you say that I am? And you see, that's the question you and I, if we're born again Christian, we had to answer that question one day. Oh, that question may have not been exactly like that. I remember the question. The question that was given to me as an 11-year-old boy, I can't get it out of my mind. Why should you be allowed to be in heaven? And as a boy, I couldn't answer that. If you would die right now, why would God allow you into heaven? I couldn't answer that question. Preacher said, if you want to know how to answer that question, you come forward and we'll show you in the Bible how to do that. And I went forward and received Christ. I couldn't answer the question. Because of a personal decision, Jesus asked them, this must be personal. Who do you say that I am? And it was a purposeful decision. Who 
do you say that I am? Am I just a good teacher? Am I John the Baptist? Am I Elijah the prophet? Who, who do you say I am? And we see the divine answer in verse 29 also. In verse 29, the Bible says, And Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. Good old Peter. Old foot and mouth Peter. Every time Peter ever spoke, he always stuck his foot in his mouth. This was one time he didn't. I had a friend who was very angry. He gets real angry at preachers. He said, how can you say that about Peter? Peter was a great man. He gave up everything to follow Jesus. I said, now granted, Peter was a great man, but he was much greater after the Holy Spirit was placed upon him. But before he, you know, he was baptized by the Holy Spirit, he was literally pretty mixy, you know, kind of iffy every once in a while. But here Peter said, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. We see his, this single response. Only Peter answered. Only the 10%. Remember I talked about uh, the boat when Jesus said to Peter, come out of the boat. If you, if, you, if you want to believe that I am he, you come out of the boat and come to me. And only one came out, 10% came out. Folks, only 10% really grasped the true lordship of Christ. The bottom line is Peter was that one, and he said, you are the Christ. We see it was a spiritual revelation. Peter must have been a smart man. He must have had that book by Josh McDowell more than a carpenter. No, he didn't. Well, he must have had the Bible. He, he read the Bible all the time. He had a Bible, but it wasn't the Gospels. We have much more than the apostle Peter had. We have much more available to us. I don't think there's more books that we could read. I, I think you, could, you couldn't live long enough to read the books that are being published today. You couldn't live long enough. All the different Bible versions. The different, and if it's not enough that you have Bible versions, you've got different types of Bibles in the versions. Wow, it's, you know, it's unbelievable what we have available to us today. But in Matthew 16, verse 17, Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You see, it was the Holy Spirit that revealed it to me that day I got saved on Father's Day. It was the Holy Spirit that spoke to me and said, Jesus is the Son of God. If you want to get to heaven, you better walk down that aisle and find out how to do it. And I put him off for at least two, three verses. And finally, I bargained with God. I said, if you'll give me one more verse, I thought, this will be it. This is the last verse. If you'll give me one more verse, I promise you, I'll go down. And I heard the, the, the music go down, and I thought, well, this is it. And the pastor said, you know, I'm going to have one more verse. And he said, that verse is for you. And man, it was like a thunderbolt. I couldn't have stayed back. I went forward and got, got there in that front of that, that church and that Sunday school superintendent was there and he came to me and took me to the Bible and showed me in the Bible how to be saved. Folks, it was God who revealed that to me as he revealed to you your need for salvation. In verse 30, we see a demand of silence. <laughs> and then he strictly warned them that they should, not, they should tell no one about him. Now, see, that's not after the resurrection, after the, rex, after the resurrection. Jesus tells them in John 1, 8, Go ye therefore into all the world, to Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. We see here, because of the confusion that's generated, Jesus said, you don't tell anyone right now. There'll be plenty of time. Peter will lay his life down upon a cross one day. He'll be crucified himself to a cross because he loves Jesus. There'll be plenty of time, Peter, to tell them that I am the Christ. Because of Calvary's grace, he told Peter, let's not talk about it right now. There'll be time. Verse 27, who do men say that I am? Some might answer he's a legend. Just a good man. He's a legend. 
Might, though, might be those who say he's a lunatic. He was crazy. He said he was the son of God. He said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll build it up. And they laughed at him. It's going to take how many years for Herod to build this? And you're going to do it in three days? There are some who would, might say he's a liar. Because he said that he was the son of God. You see, the choice of Bethsaida is the popular opinion of today. Leave us alone. We don't want anything to do with this. We're too busy. We've got too much to do. Leave us alone. Verse 29, but who do you say I am? And the greatest choice is he is the Lord. He's not a legend. He's not a lunatic. He is not a liar. He is the Lord. And that's what we must present to people today. We must go to those who will not come and we must go out and bring them in and compel them to come to Christ as the Lord of glory. And folks, I'm going to tell you, it's not easy this time of our life. In this time of Christendom, it's not easy. The last days, Jesus said it wouldn't be easy. But still, we must compel them, the Bible says, to come in. Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in. They're blind. If we don't compel them, who will? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you, Father, that there are eyes that are blind that can see and that there are eyes father that can see that can be blinded to to stop the hindrance of the work of God and I ask father God that you place it in our own lives that we might see the blind and that we might compel them to come to Christ and oh father God help us to be reminded of who Jesus is that he is not just some good Jewish boy, but rather he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the Lion of Judah who is the Lord of our life. Well, Father God, we ask if there's anyone here tonight, for whatever reason they may have slipped through the cracks and perhaps uh, somehow prof- made a profession but never received Christ themselves, but in your spirit you have told them that they need Christ. If there's someone like that tonight, let them come, that they might receive Christ. Father, there are those who need to come and pray. They might want to come to pray for themselves or for another person or for whatever. Let them come. Whatever decision is in the heart of of men and women tonight, Father, that you have compelled them to come, let them come. And I know you will bless them if they do. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us. And we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, Just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday.